few years ago, back in 2018, in early 2018, Malaysia's auxiliary force, a branch of the, uh, the Royal Malaysian Police uh, Cooperative, entered into an agreement with U2 Technologies, a Chinese firm, to provide the force with facial recognition software uh, and facial recognition capabilities. Security officials in Malaysia now are able to rapidly compare images caught by body cams on, the, on police officers with images from a central database. So the agency planned to roll this out um, to enhance the body cam and to enhance the body camera systems to enable not just um, real-time recording, but real-time facial recognition and provide instant alerts to police officers on the presence of persons of interest from the criminal watch lists. Neighbouring Singapore followed suit pretty quickly after this. And their project is ostensibly aimed at uh, facilitating crowd analytics and managing anti-terrorism um, operations. Perhaps even worse, in April 2018, um, an AI startup by the name of Cloudwalk Technologies uh, provided software and facial recognition software systems for use by security services in Zimbabwe um, to build a national image database. Now, the problem is, is that Zimbabwe is one of the most re um, repressive regimes in the world. AI, um, Cloudwalk AI Technologies is also now providing the similar software to Xinjiang province within China, another fairly repressive area of the world. So the, the, the big question is, is will this uh, superior capability of artificial intelligence really allow leadership to be even more oppressive, to be more uh, dominant, to provide them with increasing power? Will the superior uh, capability and the rationality of uh, artificial intelligence lead us to Orwell's 1984 dystopian future of Oceania? Or will it lead us to a utopian world, perhaps similar to Plato's um, rational Calipolis? Now, it's tempting to see um, artificial intelligence as a threat to human leadership. Uh, it is something that has been in the press for many, many uh, months now around particularly what China is doing with their artificial intelligence. If the very purpose of artificial intelligence is to augment and to improve and to ultimately replace human intelligence, which is widely regarded by most of us, I think, as our real competitive advantage, then uh, is it really going to be a threat? Now, this idea about will uh, artificial intelligence ultimately replace human leadership or human intelligence? Will technology actually lead us into uh, a dystopian future? It's not a new question. In fact, it exists well before even Plato. Um, now, my expertise is, as Tony said, is in leadership and particularly leadership and social influence. And so I'm very interested in how the, artificial, the world of artificial intelligence both helps leadership, but also helps in broader societal issues like social influence um, and creating opportunities for us in things like how we might manage the COVID uh, situation. Artificial intelligence is potentially a technology that will lead us to a new epoch. James Burke, uh, a, scientific, a science historian, wrote in his book, The, the Day the Universe Changed, How Galileo's Telescope Changed the Future, that there, we've in fact gone through eight different epochs. Um, and it is fundamentally not really a matter of the issue of each epoch as we've gone through a technological epoch, which has changed the way we think about leadership that's changed the way we think about society, that's changed about the way we think about how we live and our understanding of the universe is not fundamentally a question about technology. It's really a question about, uh, or technology advance, it's really a question about how technological advances make us rethink society and how we want it to be. So the question today is, given what artificial intelligence can do, given what we've seen in terms of a very rapid rollout of technologies using artificial intelligence, would we ultimately get to follow a, ro a robot leader? Well, maybe we need to rethink what we mean by leadership in the age of AI. Maybe we need to think as, of um, artificial intelligence really as a strategic technology that can benefit leaders and all of society. Maybe we need to also think about uh, what we actually mean by leadership, how we construe leadership, what it means for us in society. 
It depends how we use artificial intelligence. It's going to depend on how we think about leadership and how we actually fo follow any leader. Uh, there are currently problems with the current theories of leadership that potentially lead to artificial intelligence being used for power as opposed to using it for democratic means. But it also depends on whether we how we think about leadership depends also whether we need a new psychology of leadership in the age of AI or whether our old uh, ideas will suffice. I want to talk about all three of these things. I want to talk uh, firstly about artificial intelligence and then I'll talk about the problems with the current theories of leadership and what might be potentially uh, an opportunity for us for a new psychology of leadership in the age of artificial intelligence. So let's talk uh, about what the game changing effects are for artificial intelligence. Um, there are three things, I guess, that are important that, that come from, from my understanding of it. The first is that there's an op opportunity for intelligent automation of business processes using robotic technologies. Uh, it'll also help us in terms of augmenting um, both uh, labor and our capital. We we're already, already seeing uh, artificial intelligence being used to engage with our customers and employees through natural language processing chatbots, uh, through intelligent agents, um, and through machine learning. But I, for me, the really exciting thing is about artificial intelligence is the opportunity to really accelerate innovation, to be able to use artificial intelligence to gain insights through data analysis and enhanced, more precise and cost-effective predict, cost effective prediction based on algorithms that detect patterns in vast volumes of data uh, and interpret their meaning. That ability to accelerate innovation, that ability to actually detect patterns, to gather lots of data, to provide a predictions and understanding of complex systems is going to be really, really useful, I think, for leaders uh, in the workplaces of the future. So artificial intelligence has great potential, I think, to transform our world for the better. Um, a European Commission report uh, just recently found that it has, and it already is, improving healthcare, that it is reducing energy consumption. Artificial intelligence is making cars more safe and more efficient. It can be used, artificial intelligence can be used to predict um, environmental and climate change. It can help us to predict uh, and predict financial risk and improve financial risk. Artificial intelligence provides management with tools to manufacture uh, that produces less weight and builds products that are much more tailored to the specific needs of their consumers. AI also, AI also is very useful for authorities in terms of detecting fraud and cybersecurity. I think we had uh, a session recently, or we've got one coming up on cybersecurity. Um, and it enables law enforcement agencies to fight crime more efficiently. So artificial intelligence can benefit society and it can benefit leaders uh, tremendously um, if we choose to use it. But it does raise some serious legal and ethical questions and particularly issues around trust. So the challenge for leaders in the age of artificial intelligence is to really understand how to develop firstly a really solid understanding of artificial intelligence technologies and how these are going to shape the future of work. They also need to start perhaps seeing artificial intelligence as a new member of labor, a new uh, virtual labor, if you like. And then the consideration is how do we manage that? And then lastly, and perhaps most importantly for leaders, with the issues of repression and the issues of job displacement, um, there are considerable issues regarding trust. And the big question for leaders is how do they manage the issues of trust as they start to implement more and more artificial intelligence technologies into our workforce and into our societies. Okay, so technology has changed the way we live, the way we work and the way we lead in the past. It has always been a human decision about how these technologies will be used. Think back to the Industrial Revolution. Think back to uh, the advent of the computers in the 1960s. The question that concerned many of us um, is whether AI could be used as a tool of repression, a new version, if you like, of Blake's uh, dark satanic mills, or will artificial intelligence liberate us? Well, as I said earlier, it's really about how we think about leadership and about followership much more perhaps than how we think about technology. 
So let's think a little bit more about and discuss a little bit more about the idea of leadership in the age of artificial intelligence. And as I said, it depends really on how we understand leadership. Now, in the current understanding, current state of leadership, um, first thing to, to note is that there is no really agreed definition. In the academic literature, there is at least, in my counting, about 220 different definitions of leadership. Um, I also have the privilege of teaching leadership at the um, Defence Force Academy, uh, the, the military um, and Defence Force uh, Strategic Defence St Studies area at the ANU. And in the Australian Defence Force publications on leadership, there are 16 different, different definitions just for Australian Defence Force. So we've got no real agreed definition, which makes it really difficult to then say, okay, well, if there's no agreed definition, then which theory is going to be the most appropriate? Well, at the moment, we've got essentially three theories operating. We've got still operating. We've got the theories of heroes, of authorities, and charismatics. We've got the idea of leader as being uh, all about um, power, personality as power, what used to be known as the great man theory. That is that there are certain number of different traits, identifiable traits that are natural to any leader to, that, uh, that might, uh, might come forward. And that we can identify those traits, we can test for those traits. And this leads to an idea that there are some of us that are born to lead and some of us who are destined to follow. Um, and we can identify those. The trouble with that idea, that, tr that idea of the leader as the hero is that um, it does lead to a lack of democracy. It does lead to this idea that some of us are going to lead and some of us are never going to be able to have that opportunity. Another problem with it is there is simply just no very robust data that says that there are a certain number of traits that allow for a certain person to lead. And part of that is because there are many different definitions, but also as we'll see, there are many different contexts. One simple example is the sorts of personality traits that people look for in leadership in a prison population is quite different than it would be in say a not-for-profit charity. The other um, idea about leadership is the leader as a transformational leadership, the Elon Musk kind of approach. This is the person who is able to inspire people to go beyond the, the average, to, to inspire them to great deeds uh, and to, to new ways of thinking. Well, essentially, there's two different types of parts, or there's two parts of this theory. One is the deductive theory of Bassanavolios, which is essentially a, a set of uh, qualities that certain leaders have, and we can test these with a thing called the multi-factor leadership questionnaire, perhaps, and that certain people have these transformative qualities and some don't. And then there's the inductive uh, approach by Peters and Waterman, which argues that essentially there are a number of different behaviors that a leader will, will need to, to do, such as individualized consideration, uh, such as um, being able to structure, um, uh, being concerned about structure. The trouble is, is that there are many questions that are unanswered by that theory. We don't know. When do you actually provide individual consideration? What kinds of structures should you be putting in place? And when should those transformative structures uh, be put into place? The difficulty with that, the, the fact that these questions aren't really clearly answered in the theory means that many leaders often think, well, what I need to be is transformative. So new leaders, the first thing they do when they get into a new firm is transform it. Uh, go through a, a, a new restructuring program. But we started off with the idea of leaders as being, uh, uh, the idea of repressive leaders, leader as power. And this is about the leader's authority. This is the leader who through their strength of will and through their resources of power, get to change the world dramatically. It's through force of will, their ability to apply their strength uh, to get people to do things. Jack Welsh, when he first started at Ge General Electric, was known as Neutron Jack because he transformed the organization, sacked hundreds of thousands of people. He was very successful over time, but he was also known as a very strong leader. I've got to say, in my consulting work, many of the co companies that I work with, the executives will often say, or the chief executive will often say to me, well, what I need is more strong leaders. And when I ask the, the chief executive of the board, well, what do they mean by strength? What they typically say is that I want them to be able to get people to do what they tell them to do. In other words, they see it as very agentic, the idea of force of will of, and power, of getting power as a resource. So 
Uh, and one other example of this actually, um, recently through Macquarie University, I was working with a, a bank on a leadership program. At the end of the program, uh, the chief executive of the bank came in to talk to the staff and to, to give the kind of final, final presentation. And he said to them, look, when you become a leader, one of the things, one of the hard things, it's a very hard job. One of the things that's very hard is that you, when you become a leader, you have to give up all of your old friends. You have to give up all of those colleagues, those relationships you used to have when you were, uh, when you were participating in the line. Because as a leader, you need to make hard decisions. You may need to make unpopular decisions. You're going to need to make hard decisions about people who were previously your friends. This is the idea that you need to separate to have power, that you need to be different and separate from your followers. And I think that's the biggest problem with the current state of leadership. It is a separatist approach, whether it's a hero, authority, or a charismatic, it sets leaders apart from followers. It says that, there are, that they are different, that they're unique, that they're not like the rest of us. And unfortunately, that leads to significant problems when it comes to the issues of influence. Okay, so, if we look at the idea of authority a bit more, a bit uh, on power over as opposed to power through, the top part of this chart looks at power over people. And essentially here is it says that leadership is really about power through coercion or co-option. Uh, and it can be used to affect the behavior of others. So if you threaten uh, dire punishment for disobedience, for example, and then instruct people to march off towards a particular destination, then they'll probably do so. Similarly, if you offer them great inducements to, um, for, for obedience, then they'll probably do the same thing. But in either of these cases, it's most unlikely that they'll be influenced in a sense that they come to, um, that they'll be influenced uh, in a way that they come to see this mission of the leaders as their own mission. It is this part of the, the process. It is this issue that people don't see it as their own mission, but are just doing it because they're forced to do this externalized social control that makes it a very expensive, very inefficient process. First, because leaders need to keep people under continuous surveillance in order to ensure that they continue to comply. And second, because leaders need to expend more and more resources to impose their will on an ever alienated populace. One can only rule on such a basis uh, for only long, for, for only so long. On the bottom side of this chart, though, you can see that in contrast, if one can inspire people, if one can start to get a sense of identity between people, uh, a control of identity, if one can uh, inspire people to want to travel in a different, in a given direction then they'll continue to act even in the um, absence of a leader. If one can be seen as articulating what people want to do, then the act of persuasion increases the credibility of the leader and makes future persuasion uh, both more likely and easier to achieve. In other words, instead of being self-depleting, true leadership is self-generating. Leadership is really never about being able to coerce or to co-opt people. Such things are often indicators and consequences of the failure of leadership. And unfortunately, I think for much of the work that we've been doing, leadership has failed. We spend, over, we spend billions of dollars a year in developing leaders through MBA programs, through corporate programs, and so on. In fact, in the United States, it's been calculated it's about $50 billion a year is spent just on leadership development in corporations. So how are we going in that sense? What's happening? Uh, well, unfortunately, the current state of leadership, the results aren't particularly good. As you can see here, uh, according to the Edelman Trust Barometer, few people trust their leaders. Uh, there is low levels of employment and uh, employee engagement worldwide, according to Gallup. Job satisfaction is below average and executive tenures are decreasing. And the growth, according to the Australian Productivity Commission, the gro growth of multi-factor productivity is not only in steady decline, but it is well below the, the, the long-term average. So these sorts of things that we would expect our corporate leaders to perform and to do well, well, that's not particularly happening. And I think part of the problem is, is because of this idea that leaders are separate and therefore leaders need to have power and that power separates them even further. 
and requires them to have then more and more resources of power. And artificial intelligence is now being seen as another resource. So perhaps we need uh, a new psychology of leadership. As the European Commission uh, argued that trust is essentially a prerequisite to ensure that we have a human centric approach to artificial intelligence. Um, and to achieve this trustworthiness, I argue, then the values on which our societies are based need to be fully integrated in the way artificial intelligence develops. The idea that artificial intelligence uh, is going to change the world is true, but it'll only change the world in the ways we, we really want it to. And we need to go back to say, okay, well, how do we want to be led? What is it really that we want out of this? Do we actually need to have a new way of leading, a new understanding of leadership? Let's talk about that in a bit more. If leadership is about simply about desirable traits and behaviors, if we think that leadership is about strength and charisma of someone making decisions for us and directing us where to go, do we really just doom ourselves to being uh, mere followers to the status of mere followers? Do we really open ourselves to the real possibility of being led by robot leaders? Well, one way of uh, thinking about leadership is, and to, to rethink leadership is through what's known now as the new psychology of leadership or the area of my research, my doctoral research, um, known as the social identity approach to leadership. This is social identity is one of the fastest growing areas in social psychology. In fact, it's the dominant area of social psychology now and social influence, but it's also growing. It's one of the, the fastest growing models and theories of leadership uh, in the literature. Um, and it says that it argues that leadership is not just about leaders and it's not just about follow leaders and followers. It's about leaders and followers in a social group because leaders are actually never just leaders of um, just leaders. They're leaders of a nation. They're leaders of a religion. They're leaders of a political party or they're leaders of an organization or a division or a work team. Effective leadership is therefore always about how leaders and followers come to see each other as part of a common team or common group, as members, if you like, of the same in-group. It's therefore got very little to do with the individual, individual, individuality of the leader. It can, that word is a hard one in the morning. Um, and everything to do with whether they are seen as part of the team, as a team player, um, and as able and willing to advance team goals. In short, the key to leadership is understanding it as a we thing. If leadership is a we thing, and I believe it is, then it's really uh, about understanding what this means, where it comes from and how it works. Leadership is ultimately a process whereby one uh, or more members of a group influence other group members in a way that motivates them to contribute to the achievement of group goals. One last thing to say about that, is if you do look at those 220 odd versions of leadership uh, definitions, there is one common idea that runs through those. And that common idea, the predominant idea in those is that leadership is ultimately about influence. So let's talk a little bit about this new psychology of leadership and a little bit of background to this idea of who is us, uh, this idea of the group. Well, firstly, who is us, this idea of social identity, um, is something that it changes with context and therefore so will leadership. So as I said, we are, leaders are always leaders of some group. Uh, we are members of sports groups. We tend to be members of political groups, of national groups. Uh, we tend to be of rec recreational groups, of family groups and so on. We have this sense of ourself, not just as an individual, the, the I part of my sense of self, that separates me and makes me different to, um, to Tony Carlton, to Suzanne Holmes, uh, who you'll meet shortly, uh, and to the rest of you, but also have a sense of myself as a member of a group, of a sporting group. I'm a, ma I'm a great supporter of the uh, Eastwood Rugby Union Football Club, for example. Um, I also am highly identified as uh, a member of and a, and a graduate of Macquarie Graduate School of Management. We all have this sense of us, but it's only that sense of us that is important at certain times. The group that I see myself and the sorts of things that I see as important when I'm with my football mates in the sports group is very different than when I perhaps see myself teaching at the Macquarie uh, Business School. 
when I'm at Macquarie Business School, I have a certain way of behavior. I take on the norms and standards um, that are established by that group and that I have taken on as being an important part of myself. But when I'm with my sports group, then I tend to adapt to the norms and standards of behavior and have different goals uh, that I'm trying to achieve. Now, the way people join groups is that they see the group as being firstly normatively similar. That is, these people have the same sorts of values in that particular issue that I have. I'll see them as more like me, so there'll be a comparative fit, more like me than perhaps other groups. I'll see Eastwood Rugby Union Football Club as different perhaps to Randwick uh, Rugby Union Football Club. So there's that comparative context. But also there's this idea of readiness. Am I ready to actually adopt that group? And that'll depend on whether I see that context as being relevant or important or salient at that particular time. Now, the sorts of leaders that I'll look for when I'm in my sports group will be very different perhaps than I'll look for in an academic setting or in a political setting. Um, parties uh, to the leadership process need to define themselves in terms of a shared group membership and engage with each other as representatives of a common in-group. It's because we can stop thinking about us as individuals and start thinking about us as a group that we can start to really work together um, and stop thinking in terms of what divides us as individuals, but focus instead on what unites us as group members. And that there then is a basis for both leaders to lead and followers to follow. In fact, if there is no sense of us, there's probably no leadership. Um, as you'll see. So the leadership in this sense says it's not about your individuality. It's about how well you work within your group, whether you are perceived to be a member of the team, seen to be a member of the group. And there are four, I guess, principles to this, this in the social identity approach to, to leadership. And these four principles, I think, are aided and assisted brilliantly by artificial intelligence. The first one is that a leader needs to be perceived to be one of us. We follow our leaders, not theirs. Think about it. During wartime, we'll follow our wartime leader, not the enemy's wartime leader. It's not about whether they've got individual capabilities, that they've got individual personalities that make them a great leader. We choose which leaders we want to follow in that particular context. So a leader first thing needs to be somebody who is perceived to be most like us and least like them. They need to be perceived to be standing for us and standing with us. A leader also needs to be perceived, needs to be able to create a sense of us. They need to be able to help us to understand who we are as a group and how we are perhaps better than and different to other groups. In an organizational setting, we hope that our chief executive will help establish uh, who we are as an organization and how we differentiate ourselves from competitor organizations or other organizations. But that'll change also. So for example, in some cases, um, we will want our leader to focus very much on a small group. In other cases, we might want to focus on a, on a larger group. Sometimes we might want our local member, local political member to focus on our local community. But if our local, uh, political member is also our national leader, our prime minister, we would hope that our prime minister, when it's a national context, will defend our national needs and incorporate a sense of all of us as a nation. We also want our leaders to do it therefore for us. We want our leaders to be able to take the fight out there for us. We want them to look after our goals and to help us to achieve our goals, not their goals. And lastly, we want our leaders to embed a sense of us. We want them to not just to uh, create a sense of us and be one of us and do it for us, but when they understand us, when they understand our norms, our values, our behaviors as a work team, as a company, as a society, we want them to be able to build structures and processes and systems and rituals and, and, and ideas that make us a reality in the world, that help us to be us in the world. And Nelson Mandela was a great idea, a great example of somebody who took this idea of, dif of difference and brought it together, particularly during the Springbok uh, games, the, the sense of white supremacy uh, in South Africa and changed the meaning of that, created a sense of us and united the group, uh, united uh, Africa under a rainbow nation as opposed to distinct and separate groups. 
So let's, let me just explain a couple of things on this and uh, as a way of giving you a bit of a, an example of um, how this might work and how this does work from the research. Now, there is about 40, 50 years of research. This, uh, this work started in 1970s in Bristol in the United Kingdom with a guy by the name of Henri There is now uh, an exponential growth in research in this area. And just a couple of pieces of research to back this up. Firstly, the idea of doing it for us, uh, enlisting us in a common vision. One piece of research looked at uh, this guy by the name of Chris. Uh, Chris was established as being uh, somebody within a university who was um, uh, able to reward certain groups as a member of a student council, uh, as the president of a student council. Now, he built up a history in the student council of either awarding the out group, those people were anti-normative uh, to the group. Uh, he was also uh, built up a history in another experiment as being fair uh, to both the in group and the out group. Um, and then in the third experiment as being fair to um, the, and most fair to the in group, to the one that was normative group, the one that was most like us. Okay, so in this experiment, uh, it was subjects were told that uh, Chris um, had established a set of billboards um, in the university, and they were asked to provide uh, open-ended suggestions and considerations as to how Chris might uh, deal with these billboards and what he might do with these billboards. So each of the subjects was presented as Chris as anti-normative, Chris as fair, or as Chris as normative. Um, and they were then asked to provide open-ended answers, open-ended uh, suggestions. What we can see from this chart is that when Chris was fair, he got a good number of, uh, perceived to be fair to both groups, he got a good number of, uh, of ideas. When Chris was perceived to be anti-normative to really being favouring the out group, what we saw is he got almost no helpful ideas, but got quite a lot of unhelpful ideas. What's more important, however, is that when Chris uh, was seen by the subjects as being one of us, as doing it for us, as, as championing our interests, not only did he get more ideas, he got much more helpful ideas than he got unhelpful ideas. In other words, being one of us not only is able to enlist us in a common vision, but it is also very helpful in terms of innovation and in getting to, uh, followers to wanting to willingly to help and so on. So doing for us here, what we can see is that the leaders, that a leader who champions the in-group interest um, impacts not only his ability or her ability to demonstrate leadership, that is to influence the views of followers, but also the capacity to achieve impactful leadership, to engage followers so that they can contribute to the achievement of group goals. So we need our leader to be one of us, not separate from us. A leader to be one of us needs to really understand us, needs to really get a sense of what we're all about, needs to understand our norms, our values, and our goals. And they need to understand those in finite detail. And artificial intelligence could be a great boon to help leaders to do that. And I'll come back to that in a second. But let me ask, uh, let, let me deal with one further question. That's the issue of trustworthiness. The one that the European Commission saw as being critical to the implementation of artificial intelligence. To, tr to, achieve tr to achieve the kinds of benefits of artificial intelligence, trustworthiness needs to be ensured according to the European Commission. Now, in the research that, that has occurred in the Australian Defence Forces um, and what we've seen from first, um, first responders in 9-11 and research going way back to the 1950s with military um, and with uh, emergency services people, we find a, a number of really key things. The first is, is that leaders uh, in those situations, when, sorry, when people are in a crisis situation, what they look for is leaders who can give them a sense of direction and a sense of structure. That is, tell me where to go and tell me how to go there. How, how to actually help myself in this crisis situation. But what we also know from a really good body of research is that leaders, uh, the people don't just follow any leader in those situations. They don't just follow any direction or any structure from any leader. They follow the direction and structure from their leader. They follow the direction and structure from leaders who have built social resources amongst the group before the crisis occurred. 
we saw in 9-11 that firefighters didn't follow every leader. They only tended to follow the leader of their unit. So leaders, so firefighters who were told, get out of the building, it's going to collapse by other unit leaders, tended to continue to go up the, the stairwell rather than to go and save themselves. Ultimately, trustworthiness, we've now seen from a range of different studies in military settings, in emergency services settings, in corporate settings, trustworthiness is essentially an in-group phenomenon. We trust those people who are like us, who are one of us, who are part of us. And for leaders to be able to establish trust in, our, in artificial intelligence, separating us is not the way to do it. They really need to start be, becoming one of us and start to be perceived as an equal member of the group, somebody who has the group's an, ambitions at heart, who is going to champion the group, but also will share the same fates as the group. So how is this new psychology any better than the ones we've got in the, in the, had in the past? How is it any better in terms of really harnessing uh, leadership? Well, the, artificial, the um, EU Commission report says that we need to empower uh, human beings to really foster artificial intelligence solutions, and that we need to monitor, and impact, uh, monitor to the impacts that they create and ensure that they, this happens in a way that protects our rights and our values. It's therefore essential if we're going to do this for individuals to gain awareness, knowledge, and understanding of the capabilities, the challenges, and limitations, not just of artificial intelligence, but also of the people that will be impacted by artificial intelligence and the people that they want to lead. New, new leaders need to build trust. And the principles of artificial intelligence, uh, uh, leadership in the age of artificial intelligence, um, really need to be boiled down to developing that trust. In the research over the last 20 years, we built a really good understanding of this new psychology of leadership and how to establish identity, establish influence and generate power through that. And we've developed a methodology that allows us to do this as well through, the, uh, through people like Alex Haslam, Stephen Reicher and Michael Plateau. Uh, the second edition of their book, The New Psychology of Leadership has just been launched. Um, and uh, I'm proud to say I'm featured, uh, particularly in chapter nine, uh, in the ap application of this process um, and some of my work. It goes into five stages and it, rather than taking people away on a training course and saying, here's the, you know, all the things that great leaders are and great leaders do. What we do is we get leaders to actually work with, with, with their teams. So the first thing we do is actually talk about why groups matter and, and why uh, the value of uh, groups to leadership is important and how they can start to harness this. We then ask them to go into their workplaces, to go back to their teams, to go back to their groups and start to work out who those groups are. We use a process called social identity mapping and artificial intelligence has been brilliantly useful in terms of helping us to understand not just the groups that work in any particular organization, but how they relate to each other, where the conflicts are, where the barriers are um, and the areas for potential real generation of social capital. They then work with those groups that they identified in that process to, think, to talk about and to engage in a discussion about what we are about and what we want to be, to help develop this sense of us and to create perhaps not just a finite a, a, a subgroup, but a superordinate group, a sense that we are not just one group, one team, but a number of teams working together. Um, then the Next step, the fourth step, is working with leaders to get them to implement strategies to help them to achieve the subgroup goals as well as the superordinate group goals and to embed that group identity into the visions and the structures. One of the things I talk about with my leaders is that when you are presenting your vision to your groups, you need to present your visions as realizations or your proposals as realizations of their goals, not of yours. And then lastly, any kind of investment in an organization. As, a, as a, somebody who works in strategy, I want to see a return on investment. If we're spending money on the development of leaders, if we're really looking for change, that needs to be measured. And it needs to be measured not just by another 360, it needs to be measured in terms of organizational performance and then decisions made in terms of where we may need to go. Because remember, leadership, uh, groups change, the context change, and leadership needs to change with them. So artificial intelligence gives us great opportunities to feed information into this. Leadership, um, strong leadership is really about separating leaders and followers. 
And because of that, this idea of leadership, a strong leadership, um, is ultimately failed. Leadership is essentially a skill. It's a really, really difficult thing to do, and it's a lot of skill required. But it's a skill that works on this idea of a collective vision, where the leader is part of the group, stands for the group, champions the group, and shares the fate of the group. Artificial intelligence provides both the leader and the follower with information and decision-making power uh, that could break down the divisions between the leader and the followers. But it could also broaden our sense of us. It could perhaps break down the barriers that uh, stop us from being a broader sense of we. At this AI dawn of a new epoch, if we want this new epoch to be Callipolis and not Oceania, then that's really up to us. Ultimately, whether you would follow a robot leader is ultimately a human decision, not a technological one. Okay, so that's it from me. Now, my producer, director, and talent agent, Susan Holmes, is waiting there uh, in the background to, uh, to field your questions and send them through to me, of which I will do my best attempt at, um, at doing. Susan um, is um, on the line now, I think. Yeah, thanks, Randall, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so the first question that we have is, you mentioned the new psychology of leadership. Is this the same as contingency theory? That's a really good question. It's not, uh, it's not the first time I've had that question. Um, contingency theory really raised some, I think, important issues for, for leaders. That is that there are certain circumstances that require different approaches to leadership. That's, that's a really good insight. But the contingency theory, particularly the ones that were pro proposed originally by Fiedler and so on, um, still has this idea that there are individual styles of leadership and the idea is to try and find that one kind of individual, a certain type of individual that will match that particular contingency right. Um, it's very difficult in that uh, theory. The idea is that we continue to look for a new leader and that's been really, really successful because it's, it's led to a booning industry uh, which is de devoted to trying to find the right leader that is going to champion your new organization into the future. The one right leader to suit your organization is as, as it is now. It's called the recruitment industry and it's been very, very successful. But ultimately it's still about the individual. And as we said, it's really not about the individual leader or about the followers in a context. It's about the two of them together engaged in a group situation, moving towards whatever the contact context is. A leader under the uh, social identity approach needs to be able to change hats. And because it's a skill, they can do so rather than a trait. Okay. Uh, so many people are concerned with AI replacing a lot of jobs that yep. people currently do um, in a way of automating them. Is this something that's a real concern and will it increase further inequalities? Yeah, look, I think it's... Um, this is, a, this is not a new question for, uh, with artificial intelligence. Um, I mentioned the dark satanic mills of William Blake. Uh, back in the Industrial Revolution, the, um, the, the, the mills in London uh, replaced, uh, were automating the way in which um, people made cloth. Um, and it, uh, the steam engine uh, before that uh, reduced a number of people to penury. It meant that a lot of the um, small cottage industries just dissolved and people were left on the unemployment heap. But eventually that changed. Eventually we said, this is not the society we want. Eventually then it moved into a new society where we started to get unions. We started to get people saying child labor is not appropriate, that we need to have a fairer and a better system. What we've got, to, because we've got that history of technology replacing jobs in the past, We've got a chance to really look at what's happening now and say, before that occurs, let's think about how we might manage that transition. And that really comes back down to leaders being able to do that. And that means leaders need to be um, working with us as a society to help us to do that. So how do you align what matters to the group or your team to what matters to the organisation? Uh, this is a really good question as well, common question as well. By the way, I used to have a boss whenever I said, oh, that's a really good question. He'd say, I know, that's why I asked it. Um, uh, I have been teaching uh, leadership at New South Wales Police, one of the best experiences of my life. And um, with New South Wales Police, they often have a minister who is making decisions and wants to impose that policy down through the ranks, sometimes where they have great difficulty in understanding how they might implement that policy in a local area command. 
The challenge is not to deny that policy or to say to the minister, you're off for one, that's never going to happen. We've got a state and the minister has to look after the interests of the whole state, not just that local area command. So one of the things that a leader needs to do is to be able to find a way of aligning the organisational goals with the subgroup goals. It's a critical part of leadership and always has been. What, other, what the social identity approach does, though, is it says instead of trying to just impose through will or through power the organisational goals that may be at odds with your subgroup goals, what we need to do is to actually understand your subgroup goals, what the barriers are to achieving your subgroup goals and how those subgroup goals might help to achieve the organisational goals. In other words, engage in a discussion with that team about how what they do helps to implement uh, the organisational goals. And if they, if they don't, then the leader, by engaging with the team, can make those changes that are necessary so that the, that alignment does occur. Okay, great. Thanks, Randall. So we've got a lot of great questions around diversity and inclusion and how that actually has changed the definition and state of leadership. So do you have any comments as to how has a higher focus on diversity and inclusion changed leadership? I think diversity and inclusion is, is one of the areas that has um, perhaps also raised the issue that we need to think about a different approach to leadership. I talked about the idea of leader as hero, which used to be known as the great man theory, the idea that um, only basically only men had the capability to lead. You will see that still in pockets uh, around the world. Some religions, for instance, might have that as, as part of the process. Um, diversity and inclusion has become more important also because artificial intelligence and technology has allowed us to be a more globalized world. So a leader today in Australia might actually have a team working in Malaysia, might have a team working in China, might have a team working in, uh, in Africa, um, as well as in suburban areas of, of New South Wales. Um, that leader needs to be able to engage with the interests of all of those groups and understand those groups in detail. That becomes exceptionally complex. And so artificial intelligence helps us to understand more about what those particular issues are, as long as we're asking a particular subgroup needs and issues and values and, and goals are, if we're asking the right questions. And the social identity approach says that what we need to do is not assimilate the group into, uh, into the organisation. What we need to do is to see that group as being distinct and important contributor to the overall group. Uh, rather than saying we're all the same, you know, you and Malaysia are this part of the same company, it all works. Okay, so thanks Rosalina for that question, that was great. Um, and thanks Randall for your response. That's all we've got time for, for questions, other than we'll take maybe one last question before we close off. Um, we've got a lot of great questions around AI, so how can we trust that AI selects the best decision for us, since AI has many similar predences for a similar situation, but every situation would have different challenges. So how do we know whether to trust AI making the best decisions for us? Uh, because we, we can't, because we can't trust leaders who are independent from us to make decisions for us. Uh, the best way to actually make sure that artificial intelligence is making the right decisions for us is for us to be involved in the equation, for us to be involved in the discussion. Leadership needs to see it itself as being part of the group, as being part of us and engaged in that dialogue uh, in terms of what us wants uh, from, uh, from, from the technology and from the world and from the way we, we, get, we, we, uh, we follow and the way we lead. Wonderful. So that is all we've got time for for questions for today. I'm going to hand back to you, Tony. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne, and thanks, Randall. You've certainly put forward some thought-provoking ideas for us today. Uh, our follow-up email will include a recording of today's webinar and also some additional resources that will help you to further explore this topic. Macquarie Business School offers a number of uh, short courses on leadership and general management, and contact details, should you wish to investigate those, are on the screen now. With that, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. Again, thank you to Randall for your, for your thoughts and insights today, and I'd encourage you to watch out for future courses and webinars offered by the Macquarie Business School. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.